Hello, and welcome to another episode of Other Items of Interest. I am your host, Jack Zablocki. On this week's Other Items of Interest, it's dumb criminals galore. Also, worried about space pirates? Senator Ted Cruz has Space Force for that. And relive Princess Diana's last moments at the Inquirer Museum. Don't worry, they promise it's tasteful. All that and more on this week's Other Items of Interest. Connecticut fugitive got the 15,000 Facebook likes, but breaks vow to surrender. Jose Sims agreed to turn himself in if the police Facebook post containing his wanted poster received 15,000 likes. Can't trust a criminal. Police in Connecticut say a fugitive has so far failed to honor an agreement to surrender once enough people responded positively to his wanted poster on social media. Torrington police say Jose Sims has seven arrest warrants and is being sought as a fugitive after failing to appear in court on charges that range from breach of peace to risk of injury to a child. He's believed to be somewhere in New York. So if you're in New York, keep an eye out. Torrington Police Lieutenant Brett Johnson posted on the department's Facebook page Wednesday that Sims had contacted him through the social media site and agreed to turn himself in if the post containing his post received 15,000 likes as we've stated several times already. The page has far surpassed that number. Police said Friday that they will use all resources available to locate Sims. Uh, Maybe make a Tumblr post. Maybe that'll that'll get him in there. Think that'll work? Nah. New Jersey police arrest alleged drunk driver and then arrest her ride for allegedly driving drunk too. Police in a small New Jersey town arrested an alleged drunk driver Friday morning and then arrested the friend who picked her up for allegedly driving drunk too. The misadventure started just after midnight when Hackettstown police made a traffic stop on Route 46 pulling over Morgan Doran, 21, of Netcong, New Jersey, for a moving violation. The responding officer smelled alcohol and ultimately arrested her for DWI, DWI in a school zone, reckless driving, and careless driving. At the police station, she called Sebastian Reem, 24, of Long Valley, to come pick her up. But when police spoke to Reem in the lobby of the station, they smelled alcohol on him as well and charged him with DWI and reckless driving. Hackstown police said both were released to a sober driver pending a court appearance. From Comonews.com, fleeing suspect puts wrong fuel in getaway car caught after tow truck call. Deschutes County Sheriff's Office arrested Jeremy Hotha Thomas, 34, of Shoreline, Washington, after his car became disabled when he put diesel fuel, which he stole, in his 2017 Chevy Cruze that takes gasoline. The incident unfolded after deputies responded to a domestic disturbance in Crooked River Ranch where Thomas' stepfather called to report that Thomas threatened and pointed a gun at him. Caller went inside his house and told dispatchers Thomas also fired the gun. Thomas, along with his girlfriend and their three-year-old child, left the scene before authorities arrived. Multiple agencies searched the area after learning that Thomas had fled and radioed a description of the vehicle. Three hours later, a tow truck driver responding to a dead battery call from a woman tipped off an Oregon State trooper. The woman told the tow truck driver the make, model, and location of the car, and the tow truck driver relayed the information to the trooper. It was the car authorities were looking for. With guns drawn, deputies and troopers approached the car and arrested Thomas without incident. His girlfriend and child were uninjured, and a loaded handgun was found inside the car. After authorities detained Thomas, they figured out the car's battery wasn't dead at all. Thomas was driving low on fuel when he pulled over, went into a barn, and stole a gas can. He filled the can with diesel from a larger fuel tank and then put it in his car. His car became disabled once he tried to start it. Thomas was charged with menacing, pointing a firearm at another, unlawful use of a weapon, second-degree burglary, third-degree theft, and being a felon in possession of a firearm. He's being held in Deschutes County Jail without bail. From KTVU.com, man allegedly hiding drugs in butt accidentally shoots himself in testicles. That's not the craziest part. The man who shot himself in the testicles was also found to be hiding marijuana in his buttocks. 
Cameron Jeffrey Wilson, 27, was carrying a gun in his front pocket on April 5th in Washington State when the firearm accidentally discharged. The bullet pierced Wilson's testicles and then went into his thigh. Upon arriving at the hospital, a doctor was operating on the gunshot wound when a balloon of marijuana slipped out of Wilson's anus. Court records show. Police arrived at the hospital and searched Wilson's car where they also found a bag of meth. The man's troubles did not end there, though, as Wilson, who was a convicted felon, was being processed in the Chilean County Jail. He was strip-searched, and another balloon of marijuana came out of his anus. Maybe this guy just poops balloons of marijuana. Maybe that's all there is to it. Uh, Wilson has pleaded not guilty to second-degree felon in possession of a firearm and unlawful possession of meth. He also pleaded not guilty to possession of a controlled substance in a correctional facility. He's being held on a $110,000 bond. What's really funny to me is this story takes place in Washington State where marijuana is legal. It was like the second state after Colorado to make it legal. Why he's putting balloons of marijuana up his bum, I don't know. I wish the article investigated that more because it makes no sense to me. Unless it's like a hobby or something some kind of kink, but I doubt it. That's all. Next story. From KHOU.com, two Texas men dead after trying to jump open pontoon bridge in Louisiana. Two Rio Grande Valley men lost their lives early Friday morning after attempting to jump an open pontoon bridge south of Lake Charles. The pair were headed south in a 2016 Chevrolet... (laughs) It's another story that features the Chevrolet Cruze. I should have gotten sponsorship from Chevy. Uh, The pair were headed south in a 2016 Chevy Cruze on Louisiana Highway 384, also known as Big Lake Road, just after 2 a.m. when the incident happened, according to a news release from Louisiana State Police. Louisiana State Police identified the driver and passenger who died as 23-year-old Alejandro Cazares of McAllen, Texas and 32-year-old Roberto Alejandro Moreno of Edinburgh, Texas. The pontoon bridge was closed to vehicle traffic at the time to allow a boat to pass on the intracoastal waterway, according to the release. Witnesses told police that the passenger got out of the car and pushed the closed crossing gate arm up so the car could drive under it. The passenger then got back in the car and the driver drove toward the raised ramp on the pontoon bridge before stopping briefly. The car then backed up a bit and drove toward the ramp, accelerating before going up and off the ramp in an apparent attempt to jump the open span of the bridge. The car went airborne briefly before landing in the waterway and sinking to the bottom. It doesn't work like in the movies and TV. It just doesn't. The driver was unable to get out of the car and his body was found inside. The body of the passenger was found in the water outside of the submerged car. Both men were pronounced dead at the scene by the Calcasieu Parish Coroner's Office. State police obtained toxicology samples from both men whose identities will be released after their families are notified. Whoops. Did I just say their names like two minutes ago? The Calcasieu Parish Sheriff's Office Marine Division and the U.S. Coast Guard assisted in recovering the car and the men's bodies. I've always wanted to try that jump, jump the a bridge that opens in the middle. Um... I don't think I will. I think it's dangerous. And I implore all of you to, I guess, not do the same. Don't jump the bridge. From the New York Times, wow, what is that? Navy pilots report unexplained flying objects. This one is right up my alley. As I've said before on the show, this is the kind of story we we want to do. Not dumb criminals. But dumb criminals are funny, so what are you going to do? The strange objects, one of them like a spinning top moving against the wind, appeared almost daily from the summer of 2014 to March 2015, high in the skies over the East Coast. Navy pilots reported to their superiors that the objects had no visible engine or infrared exhaust plumes, but that they could reach 30,000 feet and hypersonic speeds. These things would be out here all day, said Lieutenant Ryan Graves, an F.A. 18 Super Hornet pilot, 
who's been with the Navy for 10 years and who reported his sightings to the Pentagon and Congress. Keeping an aircraft in the air requires a significant amount of energy. With the speeds we observed, 12 hours in the air is 11 hours longer than we'd expect. In late 2014, a Super Hornet pilot had a near collision with one of the objects, and an official mishap report was filed. Some of the incidents were videotaped, including one taken by a plane's camera in early 2015 that shows an object zooming over the ocean waves as pilots question what they are seeing. Wow, what is that, man? One exclaims. Look at it fly. Sorry, I couldn't act it out better. No one in the Defense Department is saying that the objects were extraterrestrial, and experts emphasize that earthly explanations can generally be found for such incidents. Lieutenant Graves and four other Navy pilots who said in interviews with the New York Times that they saw the objects in 2014 and 2015 in training maneuvers from Virginia to Florida off the aircraft carrier Theodore Roosevelt made no as make no assertions of their provenance. But the objects have gotten the attention of the Navy, which earlier this year sent out new classified guidance for how to report what the military calls unexplained aerial phenomenon or unidentified flying objects. Joseph Gratisher, a Navy spokesman, said the new guidance was an update of instructions that went out to the fleet in 2015 after the Ros uh, Roswell incident, after the Roosevelt incident. That's what's on my mind right now, aliens. We all know it's aliens, right? That's, uh, I think so. There were a number of different reports, he said. In some cases could have been commercial drones, but in other cases we don't know who's doing this. We don't have enough data to track this. So the intent of the message to the fleet is to provide updated guidance on reporting procedures for suspected intrusions into our airspace. The sightings were reported to the Pentagon's shadowy little-known Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, which analyzed the radar data, video footage, and accounts provided by senior officers from the Roosevelt. Luis Elizondo, a military intelligence officer who ran the program until he resigned in 2017, called the sightings a striking series of incidents. This seems to be a very revealing article. The program, which began in 2007 and was largely funded at the request of Harry Reid, the Nevada Democrat, who was the Senate Majority Leader at the time, was officially shut down in 2012 when the money dried up, according to the Pentagon. But the Navy recently said it currently investigates military reports of UFOs, and Mr. Elizondo and other participants say the program, parts of it remain classified, has continued in other forms. The program has also studied video that shows a whitish oval object described as a giant tic-tac about the size of a commercial plane encountered by two Navy fighter jets off the coast of San Diego in 20, 2004. My voice is starting to crack like a 12-year-old boy. Leon Golub, a senior astrophysicist at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, so the possibility of an extraterrestrial cause is so unlikely that it competes with many other low probability but more mundane explanations. He added that there are so many other possibilities, bugs in the code for imaging and display systems, atmospheric effects, and reflections, neurological overload from multiple inputs during high-speed flight. Guy sounds like a stick in the mud. It's aliens. We know it's aliens. Stop telling us otherwise. Lieutenant Graves still cannot explain what he saw. Aliens. In the summer of 2014, he and Lieutenant Danny Acoin, another Super Hornet pilot, were part of the squadron, the VFA-11 Red Rippers out of Naval Air Station Oceana, Virginia, that was training for deployment to the Persian Gulf. Lieutenants Graves and Acoin spoke on the record to the Times about the object. Three other pilots in the squadron also spoke to the Times about the object, but declined to be named. Lieutenants Graves and Acoin, along with former American intelligence officials, appear in a six-part History Channel series, Unidentified, Inside America's UFO Investigation, to air beginning Friday. The Times conducted separate interviews with the key participants. The pilots began noticing the objects after their 1980s-era radar was upgraded to a more advanced system. As one fighter jet after another got the new radar, pilots began picking up the objects, but ignoring what they thought were false radar tracks. People have seen strange stuff in the military aircraft for decades, Lieutenant Graves said. We're doing this very complex mission to go from 30,000 feet, diving down. It would be a pretty big deal to have something up there. He said the objects persisted, showing up at 30,000 feet, 20,000 feet, even sea level. They could accelerate, slow down, and then hit hypersonic speeds. 
Tenant of Coin said he interacted twice with the objects. The first time after picking up the object on his radar, he set his plane to merge with it, flying 1,000 feet below. He said he should have been able to see it with his helmet camera, but could not, even though his radar told him it was there. A few days later, Lieutenant Coin set a training missile on his jet locked on the object, and his infrared camera picked it up as well. I knew I had it. I knew it was not a false hit, he said, but still I could not pick it up visually. At this point, the pilots said they speculated that the objects were part of some classified and extremely advanced drone program. Aliens. But then pilots began seeing the objects. In late 2014, Lieutenant Graves said he was back at base in Virginia Beach when he encountered a squadron mate just back from mission with a look of shock on his face. He said he was stunned to hear the pilot's words. I almost hit one of those things, the pilot told Lieutenant Graves. The pilot and his wingman were flying in tandem about 100 feet apart over the Atlantic east of Virginia Beach when something flew between them, right past the cockpit. It looked to the pilot, Lieutenant Graves said, like a sphere encasing a cube. Wow, that's really interesting. A sphere encasing a cube. The incident so spooked the squadron that an aviation flight safety report was filed, Lieutenant Graves said. The near miss he and other pilots interviewed said angered the squadron and convinced them that the objects were not part of a classified drone program. Government officials would know fighter pilots were training in the area, they reasoned, and would not send drones to get in the way turned from a potentially classified drone program to a safety issue. It was going to be a matter of time before someone had a mid-air collision. What was strange, the pilot said, was that the video showed objects accelerating to hypersonic speed, making sudden stops and instantaneous turns, something beyond the physical limits of a human crew. Speed doesn't kill you, Lieutenant Graves said. Stopping does, or acceleration. Asked what they thought the objects were, the pilot refused to speculate. We have helicopters that can hover. We have aircraft that can fly at 30,000 feet and right at the surface, but combined all that into one vehicle of some type with no jet engine, no exhaust plume. Lieutenant Acoin said only that we're here to do a job with excellence, not make up myths. In March 2015, the Roosevelt left the coast of Florida and headed to the Persian Gulf as part of an American-led mission fighting the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. The same pilots who were interacting with the strange objects off the East Coast were soon doing bombing missions over Iraq and Syria. The incidents tapered off after they left the United States, the pilots said. Very interesting, but definitely aliens. Don't fear the aliens because Ted Cruz warns Space Force is needed to battle space pirates from Yahoo News. Senator Ted Cruz, Republican Texas, issued a dire warning about space pirates Wednesday in support of appropriations to fund Space Force, President Trump's proposed off-planet expansion of the U.S. military. This is so ridiculous, I don't think I'll be able to get through this one. I hate Ted Cruz. Space Force is stupid. Since the ancient, but that's, I guess that's what the show is, stupid. Uh, Since the ancient Greeks first put to sea, nations have recognized the necessity of naval forces, and maintaining a superior capability to protect waterborne travel and commerce from bad actors, said Cruz, the chairman of the Subcommittee on Aviation and Space. I can't believe he's the chairman of the Subcommittee on Aviation and Space. How is he, how is he, uh, how is he fit for that? I don't know. Uh, He said, pirates threaten the open seas, and the same is possible in space. In the same way, I believe we too must now recognize the necessity of a space force to defend the nation and to protect space commerce and civil space exploration. For starters, the Trump administration is seeking $2 billion in new funding from Congress for the creation of Space Force. Don't we have an Air Force that can do this? The new military branch is projected to number about 15,000, most of whom will be transferred from existing positions. In future years, its annual budget could amount to an additional $500 million over the $10 billion already being spent on unclassified space programs. Although armed Somali pirates terrorized the waters off the Horn of Africa a decade ago, their activity has diminished in recent years thanks to a robust military response from several nations, including the United States. Venezuela's descent into political chaos is partly blamed for a rise in the Caribbean piracy, 
Caribbean piracy or Caribbean piracy? You decide. Yet, none of those threats possessed resources to, as yet, mount a credible threat beyond the confines of Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, what does he think? Like a Somali pirate's going to build a spaceship? What is he going to do up there? Try to try to rob NASA? Um, I just got thrown off. Oh, well, the next sentence is what I just said. Nor is there any inter interplanetary commerce to present a lucrative target for pirates. So they couldn't even rob NASA. In February, Trump signed a directive ordering the Pentagon to establish Space Force as the sixth branch of the U.S. military. Months earlier, Super PAC supporting the president asked supporters to vote on a new logo for the extraterrestrial troopers. This is so stupid. When Democrats retook control of the U.S. House of Representatives, however, the prospects for Space Force grew uncertain. In March, Re Representative Adam Smith, Democrat Washington, who chairs the House Armed Services Committee, tried to temper Space Force expectations. It's going to be different from what the White House proposed. Three more four-star generals are not going to make us stronger in space. Even some of Trump's Republican defenders have questioned the premise that America needs to create a new military branch and hand over jurisdiction of space and its pirates from the Air Force. That's what I was saying. It wasn't on my list because I don't think we need it, Senate Armed Services Committee Chairman James Inhofe, Republican Oklahoma, said. Ever since this subject came up, I've said there are two things you have to answer. One, is it going to do a better job than we're doing today? And then two, it's going to cost more. How much more money is it going to cost? And that's that. Check the show notes and go to the link. You can look at a picture of Ted Cruz and throw up. I was questioning whether or not to do this article. It's rage-inducing, but it's so outlandish um, that it, it fits in with the other topics, I guess. From kron4.com, healthy dog euthanized to be buried with dead owner. Ain't that sick? That's messed up. A healthy dog in Virginia was recently put down so that she could be buried with her dead owner. WWBT reported the owner of the Shih Tzu mix left explicit instructions in her will to have the dog euthanized and cremated so they could be buried together. The report did not mention the dog's age. After her owner's death, the dog named Emma was placed in the care of an animal shelter in Chesterfield, Virginia. Staff said they spent the next two weeks arguing with the woman's estate after they asked her to euthanize the healthy pup. We did suggest they could sign the dog over on numerous occasions because it's a dog we could easily find a home for and rehome, said Carrie Jones, manager of Chesterfield Animal Services. Ultimately, they came back in on March 22nd and redeemed the dog. Emma was taken to a local vet and euthanized. Her remains were transported to a pet cremation center and her ashes were put into an urn and returned to the estate. It's not legal to put a dog's cremated remains or any animal in a casket and bury them according to Larry Spiaggi, president of the Virginia Funeral Directors Association and owner of the Morissette Funeral Home. They got a plug in, didn't they? But there are exceptions for private and family-owned cemeteries, according to WWBT. Euthanizing a healthy pet is not illegal, but many vets object to the practice. From Devon Live, theme park ride based on Princess Diana's fatal crash opens. A theme park ride which allows people to experience the crash which killed Diana, Princess of Wales, is set to open and charge people 20 pounds a time to take part. That seems excessive. 20 pounds a time? Uh, people will be able to vote on whether they think the royal family was involved in the collision at the end of the ride. The attraction is part of a new park celebrating U.S. magazine, The National Enquirer, and opens tomorrow in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Creator Robin Turner said, It's a 3D computer model and you're looking down on what looks just like Paris, but it's three-dimensional. It's projected and you see the buildings and everything in a 3D presentation. And it shows the pathway as she left the Ritz Hotel and the paparazzi chasing her and the bang flash that we think blinded the driver and how it happened. Turner told the website Daily Beast, There's no blood. There's none of that. You see the car crash through the computer animation. It's tasteful. The attraction will lead people through the conspiracy theories surrounding the crash. 
Turner said, you'll be pulled on what you believe was the cause of her death and who was behind it. We asked questions like, that's kind of leading. Uh, we asked questions like, do you think the royals were involved? Do you, this is very leading. Do you think she was pregnant? All we do is ask questions on, what, on what's your opinion. Turner added, it's definitely not in poor taste. It's just showing the root of what happened. <laughs> this is such bullshit. For people who have never been to Paris, it's just showing the topography and the distance and the tunnel and that kind of stuff. It's done very professionally. Rick Laney, head of the communications for the park, confirmed to the Mirror the attraction existed, although said it was a small part of the Royal Closet attraction. He said, it features an interactive screen where you can flip through the closets of Royal family members and an activity where you can examine their family trees. The Diana piece is only a small part. Princess, 36, was killed alongside Dodi Fayed, 42, in the backseat of a Mercedes-Benz driven by Henri Paul on August 31, 1997. Investigators said the vehicle crashed at an estimated 65 miles per hour into a concrete pillar in Paris Pont de Alma Tunnel. I think I butchered the pronunciation of that. The park is said to have 100 attractions within its 20,000 square foot space, including a tribute to the famed September 1977 Enquirer cover photo of the corpse of Elvis Presley in its open coffin. The place is tasteful all around. I think I'm most shocked that the Enquirer now has a museum. From News18.com, drunk man vomits so hard, throws up undiagnosed tumor, then swallows it back. All right, I'm done. I'm out. If I throw up during this article, I apologize. I'll keep it into the podcast, but... Vomiting after a hard drinking session proved to be a blessing in disguise for a man in China after doctors found out that a meatball-like mass he had thrown up and swallowed back in his drunken stupor was actually a long-ignored tumor. According to Oriental Daily, the 63-year-old man from Hubei, China, had been feeling discomfort in his throat for some time, especially when he swallowed solid food, but he chose not to seek medical attention. That's until, after a recent binge drinking session, he began throwing up and felt a sudden sharp pain in his throat, followed by the sudden presence of a meatball-like mass in his mouth. The man was so drunk that he thought he had vomited, vomited part of his body out and quickly swallowed the meatball back with a glass of water. Fortunately, the man decided to seek medical attention this time and went straight to the hospital. After hearing his story and conducting an endoscopic exam, doctors discovered that the meatball was in fact a tumor growing at the top of the man's esophagus. Further examination revealed that the tumor had grown all the way to the man's throat and risked blocking the airway. How do you not notice that? The man underwent a surgery to remove the 15 centimeter long and four centimeter thick tumor, which was later identified as a fibroma. The man had described the mass he threw up and swallowed back as a long forked tongue. Fibromas can grow on any organ and are generally benign, but depending on their location, they can still cause health problems. In this particular case, excessive growth could have made it difficult for the patient to swallow. I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm grossed out. Medical experts quoted by the Oriental Daily said fibroids are generally benign tumors, but excessive growth can obstruct eating and turn malignant. It's good to know. I'm not eating meatballs for a while. I think I just want to end the show now. And there you have it, another episode of Other Items of Interest Down the Drain. I uh, hope you had a good time. I know I did. You can visit us online at otheritemsofinterest.com or you can email us at otheritemsofinterestpod at gmail.com and visit us on Twitter at Other Items. We'll see you next week, folks. Thanks for stopping by. Bye-bye.